Well, good morning and happy Easter. Welcome to Gainesville United Methodist Church. My name is Vincent McGlone. I'm one of the pastors here. If you are new or visiting, uh, a special warm welcome to you and welcome to everybody who is worshiping with us online. Before we sing our opening hymn, I just want everybody just quick favor, quick favor, look around, see somebody you know, see somebody you don't know, and just say, Happy Easter. Can you do that? And now if you can look around again and say, can you just stand for the singing of our first I'm kidding. If you would stand and join me in the singing of our first hymn, Christ the Lord has risen today. Again, a warm welcome to Gainesville Church. What a joy it is to be worshiping with everybody here on Easter Sunday. We have just some quick information uh, about today's service, as well as to help any visitors and new people uh, out as we worship this morning. The first is this. In the back of your pews, you'll see a connection card. Uh, we as a church want to find ways to help connect with you and help you connect more with us. Uh, but we are also passionate about being in mission and service to our community. And so what we want everybody to know is that uh, we have made a pledge this morning that for every connection card, new connection card, we receive, uh, we as a church will be donating $15 per card to Haymarket Regional Food Pantry. So we would love for you to help us 
help the community. We'd encourage you to fill this out. You can turn them in after the service. Uh, there's two receptacles as you make your way out of the sanctuary where you can also place your offering, or you can turn these in at our welcome desk. Uh, if you have kids with you this morning, we do want to let you know that our nursery is still open. So if you have a little one that would prefer to be in the nursery, that is available to you. And following our service, there is an Easter egg hunt for kids of all ages. Uh, as you leave the sanctuary, turn to your left, and our children's ministry will help get you organized for that Easter egg hunt. Finally, we will be taking communion today as part of our worship service. We want you to know that here at Gainesville Church, we believe in an open table. What that means is communion is available to every single person. You do not need to be a member of this church. You do not need to be a member of any church. Everyone here today is welcome to participate in communion. We believe that God's grace and God's love is for everybody. And so we would invite you to participate when we come to that time in our service. You will receive a small piece of bread and a cup with juice. When you receive it, you can eat the bread, drink the juice, and then there are waste bins at the end of our front pews for you to throw that away as you head back to your seat. We'll explain that all again when it's communion time so that we all feel comfortable and know what's happening. But as we continue to worship, if you would bow your heads and pray with me. Almighty God, we love you, we rejoice in you, and we give you thanks for this wonderful and holy and joyous Easter Sunday. Father, we ask that your spirit would just move in this time of worship, that your spirit would be with Pastor John in powerful ways that his words would be your words, that your wisdom and your truth would be spoken. And we pray that our hearts, our minds, our ears would be open to receiving your message and that we wouldn't just receive your words, but they would rest in our hearts. They would affect our lives. They would change the way we live our lives, that they would draw us into relationship with you. They would draw us into discipleship with you. They would draw us deeper with you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Benson. Anybody want to dare a guess where Benson's from? Yeah, Minnesota. That's right. Benson is from Minnesota. No, I think that might be Texas. I want to thank what's left of our children's choir. They got out of here before I could thank them for being such a wonderful part of our services. I do want to thank our adult choir as well, and especially 10 really, really nice people. You 10 know who you are that were there at the 8 o'clock service. Thank you to you guys. It made 8 o'clock that much more special. So thank you to the choir as a whole and those 10 people for being here at 8 o'clock. This morning, as we prepare to hear the word of God, I invite you to be ready to say thanks be to God when I say with praise and thanksgiving this is the word of God. I invite you to be ready to say thanks be to God, okay? So here we go. Mark's gospel, the 16th chapter, beginning with verse 1, going through verse 7. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on the way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. That means be afraid. Don't be afraid, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. With praise and thanksgiving, this is the word of God. Oh, it's good to hear that again. It's good to see us almost back to pre-pandemic. No, we're not almost. We'd have chairs set up all down the aisles and in the back, but we're getting better. I'm just thrilled to see all of you, whether you're visiting with us the first time, whether you are coming back after you've 
now feel comfortable during the pandemic, whatever. We're so glad you could be with us on this Easter morning. You've heard the phrase, preaching to the choir? Anybody? I do that often. I preach to the choir. It means you're speaking to people who are already in agreement with you. People who already believe the way you do. I'd like to do something different this morning. I'd like all of us to assume that we fall into one of these categories. A, we have some doubts. Doubts have been creeping in about our faith. B, the church has done something to me that hurt me, so I've walked away. Three, I'm just not sure that Jesus is relevant in the 21st century. Okay? I want us to think that way for the moment. I want you to hear the message this morning from those perspectives. So I thought about that during the week, and I thought, what can I say to a group of people like that? Who wonder if Jesus is relevant in the 21st century? Who have some doubts about things? Who have distanced themselves from the church for one reason or another? Maybe the church has hurt them. We do that occasionally. Sadly, we do. We don't act like Jesus. We don't love like Jesus. We aren't as kind and welcoming as we should be. But let me tell you, folks, if you're one of those people who've walked away because of that, we're trying. We're broken and flawed people. We need to try harder. The other thing I thought I would do is I would set some goals. Okay? You got to do something, you just set some goals, right? Goals are a good thing. So my first goal is to get rid of the religious speak in the message. You know what I mean. Those code words that church people use. Things like, peace of Christ be with you. We don't do that in Giant, do we? We do it here. And a person who's not a church person probably wonders what we're talking about. Or here's another one. God laid this on my heart. What did he lay on your heart? A brick? I mean, is it uncomfortable? God laid what on your heart? And then here's another one that I like a lot. I'm praying a hedge of protection around you. You know what I want to say to that if I was not a church person? Hey, get the heck out of my yard and stop planting things in my yard. A hedge of protection? What's that mean? I feel spirit-led to do this. Okay? Casper the friendly ghost is leading you, guiding you. See, we say a lot of things that non-believers just never would understand. Non-churchgoers would never understand. My favorite, though, is bless his heart. What do you mean, bless his heart? So I'm going to try to keep all of those Christian code words out of here. I'm also going to try not to use any obscure biblical citations. See, I'm going to tell you a preacher's secret. Sometimes we preachers like to dig up obscure biblical passages just to pretend we know so much more than anyone else. People hear those kinds of things and they scratch their head and they go, what's that? What, what, what's he talking about? The second goal that I have is I want to say something this morning for those who are spiritual but not religious. Did you know that this is the fastest growing religious group, pun intended, fastest growing religious group in America today? Those who say that they're spiritual but not religious. The third goal is I want to speak in such a way, I want God to speak through me in such a way that those people who are not regular attenders who are here this Sunday, who maybe think that church is not for them for one reason or another, or they think that Jesus is irrelevant to the 21st century, I want to speak in such a way that you'll want to come back. Because we love having you here with us. We want you to be with us. I know that some people feel that they've been hurt by the church. Again, my apologies for what the church may have done. But give Jesus another chance. Don't judge Jesus by what church people sometimes do. I know that some other people may feel that they're not good enough. You know,
know, who wants to come to a place where they're going to hear about all their faults and their failings? You know, it's not that we try to talk about people's faults and failings. It's just that when we raise up the gospel, sometimes, no, I take this every week. I feel my failings. I feel my lackings because as I'm preparing a sermon, I'm going, yeah, that's not true in my life every day. No, nope, that one I failed on just yesterday. No one wants to come to a place where you get those feelings. So I want to say something that will make you understand that we can be here at church together, that you can hear the gospel, and you can find hope. You can find hope and not feelings of guilt. You can find joy and not feelings of sadness. Now, question for you. Anyone here ever heard of artistic license? Okay. Artistic license gives the artist the right to interpret in the way that he or she would like to. Well, there's a similar thing in preaching. It's called preacher's license, where we're allowed to expand upon the scriptures. That's what I'd like you to give me today, a little preacher's license to kind of expand on this particular passage of scripture. Now, let's review it real quickly. Okay, you got three women, three days after Jesus' crucifixion, they're going down to the tomb to anoint the body with spices. It was customary, especially in the Middle East, to do that. Why? Because, as Martha says to Jesus when she wants to go, he wants to go and see Lazarus. If you remember that story, in the King James it says this, Oh no, Lord, by this time he stinketh. Well, that's what happens when a body decomposes in the Middle East. So you pour a lot of spices on it. That's what they were doing. They were pouring spices on his body to keep it from smelling. Well, as they're walking, they're having a casual conversation, but it comes down to one of those things that they really hadn't given much thought to. What about this big stone that's in front of his tomb? It wasn't a grave dug six feet under. It was a cave with a big stone in front of it. Didn't seal it completely, but boy, it was big. But by the time they get down there, they look and the stone's gone. They walk into the tomb and they see a man in bright white clothing sitting there. And this man looks at them and says, don't be afraid. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He's now risen. He's not here. See the place where his body was. Then the young man tells them to go back and tell the disciples and Peter. Here's where the preacher's license comes in. I want you to imagine the scene. These women are going back to the upper room. The upper room is where the disciples had met with Jesus for the Last Supper. They had all gathered there three nights earlier. They're there this Sunday morning. They're sitting around in groups of two or three talking. All of them are sad. All of them are very sad because Jesus has died. They're all in groups of two or three except for one man, Peter. Peter's by himself. He's not just sad. He's ashamed. You see, this big, burly fisherman, he was older than the rest of the disciples. This big, burly fisherman who promised, in fact, he swore he would never leave Jesus, even if it cost him his life. And Jesus said to him, Peter, before this night's over, you're going to deny me three times. Guess what happened? It's exactly what happened. Peter denied Jesus three times that Thursday night into Friday morning. Last time, he cursed him. A little girl, little girl, came up and asked him, Weren't you one of his followers? And this big, burly fisherman who was so blustery, who was so confident he would never do anything to leave Jesus, started to curse. No, I never knew the man. Now Peter, he realizes if this Jesus really has been raised from the dead, I don't want to meet him because it's going to be time to pay the piper. I'm going to get the consequences of my actions, of my words, of my small faith. Peter then decides, maybe if I do have to meet him, maybe I need to give myself a little more time. So he starts inching toward the door. 
trying to get out of there so that Jesus does show up. He won't be there to be told what a jerk he was, what an egotistic, narcissistic jerk he was. But before he can get to the door, one of the women, I like to think it was Mary Magdalene, she gets between Peter and the door and she says, no, Peter, don't go. He said, especially to tell you. He said, oh yeah, I'm sure he said, especially me, because I'm the one who was such a jerk. I'm the one who denied him three times. I'm sure that when he wants to come back and let me know how much I disappointed him, I don't really want to be around for that. And Mary looked at him and said, no, Peter, I don't think you understand. If you could have seen the face of that young man in the tomb, if you could have seen the love in his eyes, I can't believe that Jesus sent him and Jesus is going to just read you the riot act. I think he's telling you, Peter, it's okay to come back. I think Jesus wants to welcome you back. Don't go, Peter. I think Jesus just wants to let you know that he still loves you and you're still one of his. I use that preacher's license for one reason. I think there are some of us here today that kind of feel that way, that we've disappointed God. We've covered it up, sure. We pretend that we're just as good as anyone else, but we feel that pang of conscience. We feel as if we've almost betrayed or denied Jesus by the way that we've lived. And we're afraid that we just can't come back. I'm saying to you this morning, no matter how far you stray, no matter what sin you may have committed, Jesus is calling you back this morning. He's calling you back saying, I love you. I love you because I love you for who you are. I died for you, that you might know me, that you might know my love. All you need to do is come back. Do you know what the church community is? Authentic church community, what it's supposed to be. It's a conglomeration or a conglomerate of sinners and broken people. That's what a church is. It's a gathering of sinners and broken people who acknowledge on a daily and weekly basis their need, their need for God's love and his forgiveness. That's all church is. It's a group of people who gather together knowing that they are broken, knowing that they're needy. So come back. There's a place, a special place for you. Then the other thing that I would say if I could address people who are having doubts, who wonder if Jesus is relevant for the 21st century, is this. It's the place I think that all of us struggle. Did Jesus physically walk out of that grave? Do I really believe that Jesus, after three days, got up and walked out of that grave as a human being? Because if we don't, Jesus is just a good moral teacher and a teller of good stories. And quite frankly, all of this is not that necessary. In fact, you might just want to go and get up late, have a nice breakfast, go get a round of golfing, go fishing, hang out with the family, instead of doing this. But if he really did walk out of that grave, that changes everything. That means that those three days, Friday, Saturday and Sunday are the three most important days in all of recorded history. Those three days. More important than anything else. If he did die, if he was in that grave, and he did walk out three days later, that changes everything. But people struggle with that hold their feet to the fire? Do they really, really believe that he walked out of that grave? Well, I'm going to share with you the defense that I've used 
this year, last year, the year before, the year before that, the year before that, the year before that. Why am I using it again? Because it's the best one I've ever heard. It comes from a guy by the name of Chuck Colson. Some of you might remember him. He was a man of Watergate fame. If you don't know what Watergate was, it was a group of Republicans who were on the committee to reelect the president, broke into the Watergate Hotel, got caught, and they found out that it rose almost all the way to the top. And in that time, there were 12 men, 12 of the most important men, some of the 12 of the most powerful men in all the world, and all they had to do was keep a lie going. Just continue to lie. And they couldn't do it. After three weeks, they broke. Compare that 2,000 years earlier to another 12 men who had nothing to gain, who weren't powerful in any way. If they told this lie that Jesus did rise from the dead, they were able to maintain that lie for well over 40 years, even though all but one of them were executed for telling that lie. In addition to them, there were 500 other people, many of them, all of them, were ostracized from their culture. That means today they were canceled in their culture. Many of them went to prison, and some of them even gave their lives rather than to say, I didn't see Jesus in physical form outside that tomb after he was dead. Why would that many people die for a lie. It's not a lie. Jesus did walk out of that grave. And that changes everything. That changes everything about life. You know what that means? That means that all the words of Jesus are true. All those words about his love for us. His love that is so powerful and so strong that it breaks the bonds of death. That love that is unconditional, never ending. It's here for each one of us, right now, here today. That means his words about life, not just existence. Far too often we exist, we don't live. Jesus wants to make us fully alive. He wants to make us live abundant lives. And he wants to give us a life that is eternal. That means that all of his words about that stuff are true. If it's a lie, you're better off going fishing on Sunday morning. But if it's true, it changes literally everything. This morning, as we celebrate another Easter, I want to encourage you, if you have doubts, if you're struggling with your faith, if the church has done something that's hurt you or done, not done something that hurt you, give this Jesus another chance. Give this Jesus another chance completely. Don't settle for religion. Find Jesus. Don't settle for just simply coming to church. Be a part of a community. And if this one thing, the fact that Jesus walked out of that grave is where your struggle is, I promise you with all of my heart, I have absolutely no doubt that he walked out of the grave. And if he did, then everything is different. We can't approach life. We can't approach life anymore without that being a part of our calculation. Jesus walked out of that grave, folks. And it makes all the difference in the world. Amen.
As we prepare to receive communion, I would invite all the communion stewards to go to your stations. That means those who are here up with me, I need you up here with me. I would reiterate what Benson told you earlier. All of you are welcome at this table. We make no distinction. We want you to partake of this place, this small meal that is a means of God's grace. Second thing I would remind you is that we do have two lines coming up here. We have a station in the back. Our ushers will direct you which station you're going to go to. And at the ends, there are receptacles that you can place the cup in. You have a choice. You can have the bread and the cup, or you can have the prepackaged to-go cups that you can take if you feel more comfortable with that. And then we also have a gluten-free option if you in, uh, live a gluten, that's a hard word to say, gluten-free diet, if that is your diet. I would invite you now to prepare your hearts. Let's bow our hearts and heads in prayer. Lord, this is one of those things that seems a bit strange, this whole celebration of a man's death. Because that's what Jesus said we're to do. We're to remember his death until he comes again. But if he didn't rise from the dead, then he's never coming back. Lord, you did rise from the dead. You are alive today because you are risen. Lord, I pray for each one here today, all of us, that we would have a renewed sense, renewed sense of certainty about the resurrected Christ, a renewed sense of faith that we serve and follow a resurrected Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. He wants to bring healing to our brokenness by his brokenness. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks saying, this cup represents my blood which is poured out for you. By that he means whatever sin it is, whatever weakness, whatever failing you have, it's been forgiven because of his blood. Come to the table and know his love, know his forgiveness, know his joy. Amen.
Would you all stand as we join together for our closing hymn? words he rose you know there were a group of religious leaders in Jesus's day they asked for a proof why do you say the things you say how do you have the authority to say them what can you do to give us a proof that you are who you say you are he said destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days they were standing outside the temple in Jerusalem, so they thought, he means the temple in Jerusalem. No, he meant his body. The proof that he offered that he was who he said he was, the Christ, the Messiah, was that one thing. All of Christianity hinges on whether or not that's true. I stand before you to say, I not only believe, but I know he arose. Go in that knowledge. Go in that peace. Go and find the love that he has for you. Amen. Folks, Jan Janet, folks, before you leave, you are most welcome to go if you have plans, but our choir wants to sing something for you, and it's a very special thing. There was some guy named Handel that wrote something or other, and they like to sing the Hallelujah Chorus. Mm -hmm. 